were in New York City visiting with Morley Safer, one of the co-editors of 60 Minutes. You are in the company of an actual addict. We need 60 Minutes, a little shot of 60 Minutes, at least once a week. If you could make it a nightly series, I mean, I think we'd be there every night, too. There must be also a satisfaction on the part of you doers, as there is on the part of us observers, to see particularly oh, unedifying or unattractive people I'll get their just you know, desserts. I, I don't plead any special purity uh, uh, about these things, but I think after doing this broadcast for a good many years and being a, a, a professional journalist for 38 years or something like that, you really uh, curb such... Uh, small pleasures as the satisfaction you might get in seeing a scoundrel get his comeuppance. Uh, and there's a lot of scoundrels who's, who I didn't particularly want to see get their comeuppance. A man who became a friend of mine named David Stein, who's, for reasons I don't understand, and I'm as susceptible as everyone. We all admire art forgers. Art forgers. Art forgers. Yeah. Well, they are gifted, at least. They are gifted. <laughs> they have a genuine talent. Yeah. And, and, um, they really and they are going, yeah. they are going the wise guys. Perhaps yeah. that's why. Stealing from the rich. Yeah. Stealing from the rich, uh, or the uh, rich and snobbish very often, yeah. too. To jump to another area, uh, everyone has hobbies, and most of your admirers might be surprised to learn that yours is baking. Right? And painting. And baking, painting. painting. I, and I find that they're related. Uh, yeah. Now, if you, you, when you paint, you don't mean Tom Sawyer's fence. You mean portraits, pictures, frames, landscapes. Yes, uh, generally uh, right. interior landscapes. I ask you a very embarrassing question: How good are you as a painter? Um, I'll answer it this way: I once was lucky enough to sit uh, at the same table as Henry Fonda, who was a very good painter. Uh, we we were uh, it was a party after a play, and uh, I said. Uh, to him as we sat down, uh, Mr. Fonda, I don't like to disturb you, but I've oh, so long I have admired um, your painting. And he grabbed me um, and insisted that I sit beside him and talk about painting. I talk about his painting. Uh, and I know, had I talked about his extraordinary success in the theater and, and the movies, uh, he would have been, I would have been another boring fan. Fame, yeah. So let me answer your question slightly that way. Uh, anyone who actually pays good money, as a few people have done, mm -hmm. um, and not much good money, but good money, <laughs> or, or who have admired uh, the work I do, uh, are people of extraordinarily good taste. <laughs> What comes to your mind when I say, what were your tough interviews? I don't know about tough, but intimidating, uh, I would have to say Catherine Hepburn. Uh, for a couple of reasons. I'm not terrific with uh, actors. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know why. Um, uh, well, you're used to interviewing prime ministers and philosophers and generals. Well, perhaps be because uh, actors uh, tend to be a little more I, 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 oh, or yeah. at least in my head they appear no, to be. they are in reality. And, and uh, as opposed to people thinking, great, cosmic issues or silly thoughts <laughs> um, but here is this this now Rushmore yes. of a figure that transcends acting mm -hmm. uh, and I'd met her in London she wanted to look me over mm. to see if she would go ahead with this interview that would be done two or three months hence and she did and she said well okay we'll do it on the 10th and be there at 12 o'clock, and I mean 12 o'clock, if you're there at 12.01, uh, I will not do it. She was that blunt. And so I left the office, it's a 10 minute cab ride, and I left the office at 11 to get ten, <laughs> there at so 12. Not to and wouldn't you know, I ran into a fire, and I ran into a traffic jam, okay. and the cab broke down. Yeah. In any case, I did make it. And the first role of that interview was awful, just awful. Awful. You were too respectful, too in awe. I was too respectful, I was too in awe, I was too frightened. <laughs> and uh, I was just sitting there tongue-tied while the, they changed film. And I apologized to <laughs> her. I said, 
uh, I really forgive me. I've asked five of the most stupid questions anybody. <laughs> and I will try to do better yeah. on the next role. Mm -hmm. And she said, "Well, I think you probably can do better." And she was she was being encouraging, yeah. and then it went very encouraging well. It, it went very well, but uh, there is someone. Her sense, her transmitted sense of not suffering fools is so powerful. Yes that you kind of become a little bit foolish in interviewing her. Yeah. I don't think that's 100% excusable. But there was no sense of ego that you might expect yeah. uh, to, to find. But with she's one someone. of a kind. But I first had this thought, not about Katherine Hepburn, whom I love. She but said something, by the way, forgive me for ahead. interrupting. Uh, it wasn't used in the interview because it was just in the course of, uh, of chat. And uh, talking about playing tennis, she's a great tennis player, loves to play. And uh, you know, tennis players are like any other uh, <clears throat> amateur sports people. They're always complaining about this, that, or the other. And she said, you know, she's been playing, she said, I've been playing tennis for more than 50 years. I have yet to play with a well person. <laughs> <laughs> That's a marvelous line. Of course, it's a, that's a hopeless assignment given the, uh, well, how much time do you spend on a, on a weighty story? Well, on a weighty, weighty story, uh, and by weighty I mean it takes extraordinary research mm -hmm. and constant double and triple checking, uh, you can spend up to eight months. The Len Algeta story took us eight months to nail yeah. to the point at which we were prepared to put that piece on the air, yeah. which clearly directed the audience's attention to the likelihood of his innocence. Yeah. Mr. Jeter was a black gentleman, an engineer, a well-educated man, a very decent citizen, who was convicted in total mistake and uh, sentenced to life. Right? Sentenced to life for a, a, a stick-up of a Kentucky Fried Chicken yeah. in Greenville, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only was it sloppy police work and slo sloppy, dreadfully sloppy uh, prosecutorial work, mm -hmm. um, uh, it was more than mistaken identity. They, he was black, and he was out of town, and he was therefore guilty. Yeah, it was outrageous. Uh, anyway, there, there's that great moral satisfaction at seeing justice done. I it? think that story, probably more than it, has given me more genuine pleasure mm -hmm. uh, than any I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Morley, how do you deal with a guest who doesn't want to talk? How do you get him to talk? Often by giving them a little bit of what you know. Sometimes it's all you know. Yeah. Enough to whet their curiosity yeah. and feel that they must respond. Sure, yeah. Um, if only out of curiosity. Uh, precisely. Yeah. They, just, they want to know more. Sure. Put them in a position of wanting to know more about the story or, or, than you appear to want. Or if, that's what you, if you don't want to talk, goodbye. And, yeah. and you wait, wait, wait for the phone to uh -huh. ring. That's an old reporter's trick. Yeah. I think the important thing, um, is no trick and it's very hard work is is being fair and often it's very difficult to be fair and I don't mean objective uh, I don't think that that's what we want to be we want to be fair I think Tom Wicker once described objectivity as the the ideology of the status quo uh, and I don't think objectivity is what we seek it's fairness Morley we've talked about the inevitable cynicism that many old-timers and even young people feel in today's corrupt and troublesome political climate, economic climate. Nevertheless, it's still possible to have heroes. Do you have any? Um, you cu yes, curiously, I, I mean, it tends to, they tend to be people who can really deliver the goods. I mean, Pete Rose is a hero. <laughs> And I think sports heroes are the best heroes. Yeah. And that, that kind of sports hero, and I understand how a lot of kids can be disillusioned sure. with their heroes. Different generations. And Joe days. DiMaggio, Ted Williams. Um, but uh, they tend to be that sort of hero. A hero I had as a young man, uh, and I guess the, the reason I wanted to become a reporter in the first place was I discovered Hemingway when I was about 14 years old. Uh, along with several hundred million other young yeah. men. And that's what excited me about... About travel and adventure. Language, and travel. Um, Ideas. You asked earlier about difficult interviews. Uh, I've just finished doing a, 
a story on the truly forgotten veterans of Vietnam, <clears throat> which were the women. The American Gener women who went over? Generally nurses, yeah. but others as well, but mainly nurses who were there. And uh, Yes, they are never thought of. You know, the, the, I was sort of cynical about something called post-stress traumatic syndrome that, that so many men suffer from. I'm not cynical about it now. It's there, and it's for real, and the women suffer, suffer it to an even greater degree. And I'll tell you why. As little as has been done for the Vietnam veterans compared with the GIs of World War II, and now something is happening. Um, nothing was done for the women because I suspect, because there were nurses and because there were women, therefore they sh they're supposed to be strong. Uh, they're supposed to deal with death and dying, but no nurse, no nurse in, trained in this country uh, looks around a hospital of dying and wounded people and with an average age of 18 years old. Babies, for God's yes, sake. No man in Vietnam faced combat every day. Mm -hmm. Even in the most forward uh, uh, infantry units, uh, you did not face combat every day. The women faced the results of it every day. They saw blood every day. And uh, they themselves were much older, by the way. They were 19, 20, and 21, some of these young women. Yeah. We'll be back in just a moment. Geraldo Rivera, I think, he perceives himself to be the story. I mean, the story's there, but it's only a story uh, when Geraldo is there. Yeah. And that, that somehow, uh, and his sees his, his mission in life. In dramatic terms. Clearly uh, outlined in, in, uh, in almost uh, luminous colors around the sort of gray matter of the story, yeah. as opposed to, I think, the way most reporters work, even the most egotistical, mm -hmm. uh, prefer to see it the other way around, and that all this wonderful luminous material in, in which I want to kind of fade a little bit into the background, and mm -hmm. the better to observe, uh, uh, the, the better to listen, the better to do all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a question of, I guess, style as, yeah. as much as anything. You have, on that subject, Morley, been quoted as saying, I'm more of an observer than an interviewer. Do I detect any slight reluctance to be a probing interviewer? Uh, we lately, we Canadians, are being more and more accused of having good manners and being tidy people. <laughs> um, I noticed the New York Times, and there was an election last year in Canada, in the New York Times, there was more coverage of Canada in a week than there'd been in five years. Mm -hmm. And each of the reporters the Times sent up there uh, commented on this, yeah. this kind of decency and sense of decorum. And I, th I think it's so. And to answer your question about interviewing, uh, I don't buy the argument uh, oft used by a lot of very good, very successful, very effective interviewers mm -hmm. that there's no such thing as a bad question, there's only bad answers. It's a little too glib. Yeah, there's attitude in, in there. I think there's a lot of bad questions. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of questions I don't particularly want to ask uh, because they're not germane to what I feel is the story. Yeah. And occasionally one asks questions that are germane and one asks them in a very uncomfortable yeah. kind of way. I, I think that's one of the nice things about you. You sense that you're a little bit uncomfortable when you have to say, well, your fingerprints were you're on lying. the gun, sir. <laughs> yeah. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, when I say that I, I think of myself, or the kind of work I enjoy doing most is observing, mm -hmm. it's absolutely true, because the, I get, the kick I get is out of writing the, the piece. That mm -hmm. I enjoy the whole process. But that, to me, is the most uh, painful and the most satisfying. I like newsmen, TV newsmen, radio newsmen, and women, for that matter. They tend to be of a certain type, obviously. There is a, an increasing mistrust of all news people, mm -hmm. uh, engendered, fostered, indeed, gleefully by all politicians. Yeah. Uh, because uh, they are criticized. They are criticized, but also uh, it, it, we're, we've become fair game. Mm -hmm. now. And, and they also know that they can say anything they want about us. Yeah. And not, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to
cut him off the air because he's criticized the media. So we're fair game. And uh, I think that perception that, that uh, political Washington uh, has tried to give the public has stuck. Mm -hmm. that people genuinely mistrust because we're smart ass very yeah. often. Also you have power and power is always a little bit to be mistrusted or at least carefully watched. I don't think we have that much power. I genuinely don't. First thing you and I differ with. I differ. really don't and I'll tell you I think that we have all the appurtenances and appearance and the presence of power and we mingle with power. Um, but if you start with the belief that we are fair, and I think that's a fair assumption to make mm -hmm. about American journalism, probably the fairest there is. Yes. Um, not necessarily the freest, but maybe the freest too. Certainly the fairest. Mm -hmm. That if the power is there, it is never used. But you have the power to sway public opinion, to influence public opinion. But see, that implies that that's what we want to do. I didn't mean it that way. No, but it suggests that. And you say, yeah. but you have the power to do this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the next assumption is, and therefore you occasionally do. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that happens. I think, obviously, we, can give, we give stories more play than the central figures in the stories would like us to give it. Mm -hmm. uh, contra affair, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I just don't think we have the power. And I'll tell you something. The Vietnam War television's first war, all the criticism we and heat we took for the coverage of that war. For what uh, turned out to be telling the truth about it. But, and that we somehow turned the American people around and all of that. I don't believe it. I think that war smelled bad to everybody. Yeah, but they couldn't smell it until they began to see it. The other uh, uh, questionable feeling I have about interviews uh, is, is quite simply that uh, no one ever tells the truth. Mm. I mean, the, certainly not totally. You don't. Yeah. You, you're telling a version. You're being a little bit of a public relations man of a flag sure. for yourself. Putting the best possible face. And particularly uh, politicians. Yeah. I mean, they don't. They're not just flacks, They're liars. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. are absent. And by instinctively, I think. Yeah. The politicians uh, deviate from the truth. So that interviewing is not always a, a, a wonderful exercise for a, a, a reporter. And I'd rather talk to people and look at things and then write about it. But uh, mm -hmm. the nature of television, of course, is uh, they want to see and hear the rascal. And uh, um, but I still see myself. Um, in a way, as uh, the audience's interlocutor, mm -hmm. the, 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 the guy who's fortunate enough to be sitting in that chair and asking their questions. Questions most people would want to have answered. Believe me, after this interview is over, I'm not going to say to you, you, you know, I'm sorry I gave you that answer, Steve, but you know, what I really think is X Files. Yeah. I can't think of an interview I've ever done with anyone in Washington after the cameras were off yeah. and we've gone for a drink or just sitting around an office where he hasn't said, yeah, well, you wouldn't expect me to answer that question, did you? Wow. It, it happens every time. It's kind of scary. Uh, well, it is scary. And, and it's, it's also, uh, there, is no more, uh, there is no more sense of conviction in politics. We'll be back shortly. Having interviewed so many people over the years, Morley, uh, are there any that you, uh, I'm not asking you here to name names, unless you want to, any you would be just as happy never to have to interview again, either because, well, for whatever reason? Well, I once fell asleep. Really? Uh, in the, <laughs> during an interview? During an interview. <laughs> um, uh, I plead it was because I had just crossed the Atlantic and had eaten a, a, an excellent dinner with the subject of the a man named Sir John Masterman, who ran something called the, the Double Ten Committee or the Double Cross Committee during World War II, in which they had, were, were planting agents in Germany and particularly in Portugal and those so-called neutral countries of the day, and had turned around a number of German agents to in favor Britain. the Western alliance. They'd, well, they they turned them around at the point of a gun and had them sent back. I see. False information. In any case, 
Uh, Sir John was a lovely man, the warden of one of the Oxford colleges, ex-warden of one of the Oxford colleges, mm -hmm. was not a sprightly conversationalist mm -hmm. by any means. And I fell asleep twice in the interview. <laughs> because it was one of those, uh, and I needn't remind your cameraman, uh, you ask one question and five rolls of film he later. It's a 40 minute answer. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, and each time you try to interject, he would say, no, 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 I'm, I will get to the, yes. to the meat of this in a moment. And, <laughs> and I did fall asleep. What I had done, the camera was over here, just mm -hmm. over my right shoulder. And I knocked the lens oh, dear. when I went down. <laughs> so he reached around with one hand, pulled me out, <laughs> holding like me he straight here. by the. <laughs> there wasn't another camera filming me, you see. It was just this one kind of oh, subject. Oh, so he, I woke up at one point with his hand. <laughs> provided by the Pierre, New York's landmark hotel located on Fifth Avenue across from Central Park. West Coast accommodations have been provided by the Shangri-La Hotel facing the ocean in Santa Monica, California.